You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. everyone. Thanks for downloading episode number 109 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. Y'all may or may not recall how previously on the podcast we talked about the successful Union attack on Hatteras Inlet on the North Carolina coast in August of 1861. Capturing the two Confederate forts on Hatteras Island allowed the Federals to secure the inlet and to seal off Pamlico Sound to Confederate privateers and blockade runners. The Federals had originally planned on simply neutralizing the rebel forts and then withdrawing, but Flag Officer Silas Stringham urged that the Union forces retain control of Hatteras, and so it became a base for the Federal blockaders and a depot for coal and supplies. But even beyond that, the possession of Hatteras also offered the Union military a springboard for further Army-Navy operations against eastern North Carolina. West of the Outer Banks were six sounds, the largest being Pamlico and Albemarle, and the Confederacy really had no effective means of preventing Federal ships from operating on these sounds or against a number of major coastal settlements. After the success on Hatteras Island, it wasn't long before the Union Army began making plans for a second attack on the North Carolina coast. Exactly who came up with the original plan for the assault on Roanoke Island isn't certain. Both George McClellan and Ambrose Burnside would later claim to have been the first to think of the idea. Not long after assuming command of the Army of the Potomac in the summer of 1861, McClellan had taken a keen interest in the offensive opportunities afforded by coastal operations along the southern Atlantic seaboard, including North Carolina. But the old General-in-Chief, Winfield Scott, didn't share Little Mac's enthusiasm. McClellan, however, as was his habit, took little notice of Winfield Scott's objections, and he continued to make plans for a further invasion of the Carolina coast. On September 12th, Little Mac instructed Burnside to begin raising a force of two brigades from New England that would form the core of a division for possible operations along the coast of Virginia and North Carolina. Burnside later recalled that his orders were, quote, to organize in the eastern states regiments near the seacoast, composed as much as possible of men who know more or less about steamers, sailing vessels, surf boats, and etc., and to arm and equip a sufficient number of vessels of light draft to carry this division of men so that they could be moved quickly from one point on the coast to another. The object in arming these vessels with heavy guns was to enable them to overcome any slight opposition that they might meet with on the rivers or coast without the necessity of waiting for further assistance from the Navy, which might not be at hand. All of those vessels were to be well supplied with surf boats, launches, and other means of landing troops. The vessels were to be of the lightest draft possible in order to navigate all the bays, harbors, and rivers of the waters of the Chesapeake Bay and of North Carolina. End quote. As the autumn of 1861 wore on, federal authorities in Washington began to warm to McClellan's ideas for coastal operations. Openness to such plans naturally increased after November 1st, when Winfield Scott resigned and McClellan, while still commanding the Army of the Potomac, became the new General-in-Chief of the Union's armies. Meanwhile, John Wool, the commanding officer of the Federal Force at Fort Monroe, at the tip of the peninsula in Virginia, became increasingly concerned that the small garrison which had been left on Hatteras Island should either be reinforced or withdrawn. 
In early November, Wool sent Colonel Rush Hawkins to Washington to urge reinforcement or withdrawal of the Hatteras force. Hawkins had commanded, with mixed success, the Union troops left at Hatteras after the victory there in August. He had sent numerous letters to the War Department urging further offensive operations against the Carolina coast. In one of those letters, Hawkins had claimed that, quote, 7,000 men judiciously placed upon the soil of North Carolina would draw 20,000 Confederate troops from the state of Virginia, end quote. Hawkins' suggestions had been ignored, but now with Wool's support, once he was in Washington, Hawkins was actually summoned to appear at a cabinet meeting at the White House. McClellan would also be attending the meeting. And after Hawkins presented his case for further offensive operations along the North Carolina coast, Little Mac spoke and supported the idea, and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells also leaned toward an invasion of coastal Carolina. The benefits of such an invasion were numerous. There would be the threat to the rear of the main rebel army up in Virginia. There would also be the opportunity to strike at the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad and cut off supplies flowing to the Confederate troops in Virginia. In addition, federal forces might seize specific ports that were the destinations of blockade runners and so release Union warships for duty elsewhere. And then the possibility was even floated that a federal army driving inland from coastal North Carolina could meet up with the Union force driving east from Tennessee and in that way split the Confederacy. And then, in his book, The Civil War in Coastal North Carolina, John S. Carbone writes, quote, Perhaps one last important factor helped sway Lincoln on the plan. Throughout his presidency, Lincoln hoped to draw on the support of Unionists in the Confederate states to help him establish governments within those states that would swear loyalty to the federal authorities and enable him to bring those wayward states back into the Union under his tentative plans for wartime reconstruction. Because coastal North Carolina had a large number of Unionists, Lincoln reasoned it might prove to be the best locale for launching such a plan for the reconstruction and restoration of the Tar Heel State to the Union. Such was the lure of a regionally strong Unionist population that Lincoln continued to hope and plan for a loyal Unionist government in coastal North Carolina throughout a large part of the war. End quote. Following that pivotal cabinet meeting in November 1861, the War and Navy Departments began making plans for the invasion of coastal North Carolina. Ambrose Burnside would command the Union Army Force assigned to the operation, while Lewis M. Goldsboro would lead the naval component of the expedition. The initial objective of the Burnside expedition was Roanoke Island. McClellan gave Burnside orders on January 7, 1862, outlining a plan that called for the capture of Roanoke and then moving on to the city of New Bern on the mainland, followed by the seizure of Fort Macon at Beaufort. After that, McClellan suggested that Burnside might possibly move as far west as Raleigh, which, coupled with the destruction of the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, would greatly distress the rebels. The opening act of the Union assault on eastern North Carolina, though, would be the capture of Roanoke Island. Twelve miles long by three miles wide, Roanoke Island lies just off the eastern tip of a low-lying marshy peninsula that divides Albemarle Sound and Pamlico Sound on the North Carolina coast. By capturing Hatteras Inlet back in August, the Federals had effectively secured control of Pamlico Sound, the southern of the two bodies of water. But to gain control of Albemarle Sound, the northern of the two bodies of water, the Yankees would need to capture Roanoke Island. The island was the key to the Confederate defense of the Sound. Shelby Foote described Roanoke as, quote, a loose-fitting cork plugging the neck of a bottle called Albemarle Sound. Nothing that went by water could get in there without getting past the cork. So the island was the key to the defense of the strategic sound, but, as Kevin Dougherty writes in his book, Strangling the Confederacy, Coastal Operations in the American Civil War, quote, As obvious as this fact was, the Confederates did little to strengthen the defenses of Roanoke Island. 
The island lay within the command of Major General Benjamin Huget, who, after the loss of Hatteras, ordered a regiment of troops to garrison and fortify Roanoke Island with the help of some North Carolina state militia. Then, in an effort to relieve himself of responsibility for the defense of the place, Huget initiated an extensive dialogue with Richmond over the boundaries of his department. While this went on, work on the island's defenses proceeded indifferently. Finally, in late December 1861, Judah Benjamin succeeded Leroy Pope Walker as the Confederacy Secretary of War and assigned Brigadier General Henry Wise to Roanoke Island. End quote. This isn't the first time we've come across Henry Wise on the podcast. Y'all may recall he was a political general who had served as governor of Virginia, and after the start of the Civil War, he had served in the Confederate Army out in western Virginia, where he had difficulty cooperating with other commanders. Even an officer of Wise's questionable military talents, however, could tell that the situation on Roanoke Island was serious. When he arrived on the island, Wise found about 1,500 men who he would later describe as, quote, undrilled, unpaid, not sufficiently clothed and quartered, and miserably armed with old flintlock muskets in bad order, end quote. Wise also found that the Confederate artillery on the island was badly positioned, antiquated, and lacking an adequate supply of ammunition. The naval component of the defenses was equally inauspicious. It consisted of two armed side-wheeled steamers, six small gunboats, and a floating artillery battery. Wise wasn't impressed with the little flotilla. He dubbed it, quote, perfectly imbecile. The number of rebel troops on Roanoke Island would increase to about 2,500 or so as Wise set to work seeking more soldiers, supplies, and equipment. But Wise himself soon fell ill, and command of the island's defenses fell to Colonel Henry Shaw, commander of the 8th Regiment of North Carolina State Troops. The haphazard and belated Confederate efforts to organize an adequate defense of Roanoke Island stand in stark contrast to the operation to seize the island put together by Burnside and Goldsboro. Burnside had had no problem raising over 15,000 men for his expedition, but acquiring ships for the force proved more difficult. The Navy had already pressed into service nearly every craft capable of mounting a gun, so Burnside was forced to assemble a rather motley fleet that by the beginning of 1862 had grown to more than 80 vessels. Annapolis, Maryland was the staging point for the expedition, and there, besides assembling his ships, Burnside organized his regiments from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts into three divisions— under Brigadier Generals John Foster, Jesse Reno, and John Park. All three brigadiers had been at West Point with Burnside, and he called them, quote, three of my most trusted friends. The naval component of the expedition was commanded by Flag Officer Lewis Goldsboro, who had been commissioned as a midshipman at age seven, and in 1862 was commander of the Union Navy's North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. According to plan, once the naval armada reached Hatteras, there would be a total of 21 warships of various sizes present for duty. Goldsboro was a veteran officer, but he and his seasoned sailors would find their seamanship severely tested by the foul Hatteras weather and the ragtag fleet that Burnside had assembled for the Army. The only characteristic shared by the ships Burnside's agents had assembled was that they all drew less than eight feet of water, since that was the reported high tide depth across the bar at Hatteras Inlet. When both sailors and soldiers grumbled at the sad assortment of vessels that comprised the flotilla, Burnside, to his credit, moved himself and his staff off a fine new steamship and on to the tug Picket, which was the smallest, most rickety ship in the fleet. The transports steamed out of Annapolis on the morning of January 9, 1862, and rendezvoused with supply ships and gunboats at Fort Monroe the next day. After the completion of last-minute preparations, the flotilla left Hampton Roads on January 11th and steered south. No sooner had the fleet reached Cape Hatteras, though, than a storm lashed the ships and put Burnside's earlier show of confidence to a severe test, as the little picket was tossed about so roughly that she nearly foundered in the heavy seas. Burnside later recalled, quote, 
Men, furniture, and crockery below decks were thrown about in a most promiscuous manner. At times it seemed the waves, which appeared mountain high, would engulf us, but the little vessel would ride them and stagger forward in her course. End quote. While the picket managed to ride out the storm, two gunboats and a transport went down, and another transport ran aground and was battered to pieces. The picket and the rest of the flotilla managed to weather the storm, but on January 26th, upon his arrival at Hatteras Inlet, a surprise awaited Burnside. He had assembled his fleet based on having been told the water over the bar was eight feet deep, but in reality it was only six feet deep. That difference meant quite a few vessels wouldn't be able to enter Hatteras Inlet and participate in the operation against Roanoke Island, but some of the men familiar with the coastal trade came up with the solution. Several of the larger ships would be run full speed ahead to ground themselves on the bar. There they would be held in place with tugs and anchors while the racing current washed the sand out from underneath them. It was a slow, painstaking process, but it worked, and a broad, eight-foot-deep channel was cut through the bar. By February 5th, the fleet was assembled inside Pamlico Sound. That same day, Ambrose Burnside, after a conference with Goldsboro, issued final instructions to his brigadiers, but there ended up being one final delay when a heavy fog lay everywhere on the 6th. But finally the sun reappeared, and on Friday, February 7th, the Burnside expedition was ready to attack Roanoke Island. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Early on the morning of February 7th, the Union ships entered Croatan Sound, headed for Ashby's Harbor, a point several miles up Roanoke Island on its western shore, where a runaway slave had told Burnside would be the best place to land troops. By the time the Federal flotilla appeared off the island, the Confederate defenders had constructed three forts built from turfed sand, Forts Uge, Blanchard, and Bartow, mounting a total of 25 guns and then running across the middle of the island, blocking the road that connected the north and south ends of the island, a redoubt had been built, although this was really just a set of breastworks 80 feet long, sporting a three-gun artillery emplacement and flanked by supposedly impassable swamps. And then to the west, across Croatan Sound, pushed up against the shore of the mainland, were two old barges that had been lashed together and mounted with seven guns. This makeshift floating artillery battery was grandly styled Fort Forest. <laughs> 
The Confederate troops defending Roanoke Island were from the 31st North Carolina and the 8th North Carolina, and also the 49th and 59th Virginia. The rebels had sunk a double line of 16 vessels in Croatan Sound in an attempt to obstruct the waterway, and a system of pilings was still being placed as obstacles when the Yankee flotilla appeared. The Confederates' little mosquito fleet formed up behind the pilings and sunken ships, and spent most of the day on February 7th attempting to lure the Union ships into a trap, but the Federals weren't deceived. The naval battle, such as it was, continued into the afternoon before the rebel ships broke off the action and retreated. In the meantime, the Union troop transports and their escorts had been making slow progress toward Ashby's Harbor, south of the Confederate forts. Burnside was anxious to begin landing on the island before nightfall, so at around 4 p.m. the steamers had moved inshore and began to cast off the surf boats carrying the Federal soldiers. Within an hour, nearly 4,000 men were ashore. By midnight, 7,500 Union soldiers plus a battery of howitzers had been landed on Roanoke Island. The Confederates were caught somewhat by surprise by the spot the Yankees chose to land, since they had anticipated that the landing would take place further north, nearer to the three forts. But when Colonel Shaw realized the enemy was putting men ashore at Ashby's Harbor, he deployed some 1,000 infantry along that set of breastworks we mentioned earlier, the one which was positioned to block the island's only north-south running road. Rain began to fall, and the Union and Confederate soldiers on the island spent a wet and miserable night in the open. The following morning, Saturday, February 8th, despite a heavy blanket of fog that lay across the island, the Federal soldiers began their advance northward at 8 o'clock. In his book, Ironclads and Columbiads, The Civil War in North Carolina, William Trotter writes that, quote, It was slow going. Rain during the night had turned the dirt road into mud, and Shaw's Confederates had felled trees in front of the roadway redoubt to a distance of 700 yards. Because of the restricted maneuvering room available to his attackers and the supposedly impassable swamps on his flanks, Shaw evidently thought his inferior force could hold its own. But the restrictive terrain hampered the defenders, too. Shaw could find room to deploy only 400 men at the point of contact, and was forced to keep the rest of his command in reserve, some 250 yards behind the earthworks. As it turned out, they were too far away to be of much use when needed. End quote. Burnside's plan of attack was simple. It had to be, given the nature of the terrain and the existence of only the single north-south road running the length of the island. Burnside designated Foster's Brigade to lead the attack, spearheaded by the 25th Massachusetts. Reno's brigade would follow, while Parks would be kept in reserve. The rebels manning the earthworks opened fire on the men of the 25th Massachusetts as soon as the regiment's lead companies became visible on the muddy road. Within minutes, as both sides started to trade shots, the area was shrouded in dense white clouds of smoke from the gunpowder, which hung in the humid air like curtains. Aimed fire was impossible, and one Massachusetts soldier later admitted, Quote, we could see nothing to shoot at, but taking our range by the smoke of the enemy's guns, we blazed away. We fired high and low, thinking if we covered a wide range of ground, we might possibly lame somebody. Since the muddy road seemed to be the only practical axis of advance, this allowed the outnumbered rebels to halt the Yankee forward movement with the blistering storm of musket fire and blast of canister from their three cannon. The 25th Massachusetts hit the ground, loading their rifles from a prone position, then rising up on one knee just long enough to fire before dropping to the ground again. Their advance up the muddy road literally slowed to a crawl. After two hours of such grinding punishment, the 10th Connecticut moved up to replace the Bay Staters, and the Massachusetts men gratefully fell back. Foster, realizing his brigade wasn't going to carry the rebel position by crawling up the road, decided to send the 23rd and 27th Massachusetts regiments to leave the road and attempt to move around the Confederates' left flank through the supposedly impassable swamp. At about the same time, Reno came to a similar decision and ordered three regiments from his brigade to try to get through the swamps and move around the rebels' right flank. 
Both flanking movements made slow but steady progress, as on either side of the bottleneck on the road, Union soldiers struggled and cursed and flopped around in bogs and muck that was often waist-deep. Besides the clinging ooze, tangles of thorny bushes ripped at uniforms and caught at belts and rifle slings. Advancing with the 51st New York, one of Reno's regiments was George Washington Whitman, the poet Walt Whitman's brother. In a letter to his mother, he described the flanking movement, writing, quote, We worked around their right flank through a thicket that you would think it was impossible for a man to pass through. It was mighty trying to a fellow's nerves as the balls was flying round pretty thick, cutting the twigs off overhead and knocking the bark off trees all around us. But our regiment behaved finely and pressed on as fast as possible. We were under fire for about an hour and a half before our regiment caught sight of the battery. General Reno gave the order to charge, and away we went, water flying over our heads as we splashed through it. Amazingly, Reno's men had managed to work their way through the supposedly impassable swamps on the rebels' right. The Yankees stormed out of the swamp with leveled bayonets, cleared out the nearest Confederate position, and then opened a deadly oblique fire on the main enemy earthworks. A few minutes later, over on the rebels' left flank, the 23rd Massachusetts of Foster's Brigade also emerged from the swamps and opened fire from a position of similar advantage. Hit from each flank, the Confederate line began to crumble. In Ironclads and Columbiads, William Trotter describes what happened next, writing, quote, The grand finale came in the form of a melodramatic charge by the 9th New York, whose glory-hungry commander, Rush Hawkins, was chafing in his position astride the roadway behind the 10th Connecticut. Hawkins' zouaves poured down the road, literally leaping over the heads of the astonished Connecticut regiment. Although Hawkins would soon loudly claim that it was this impetuous act which broke the rebel line, in truth his men encountered resistance only from a few stragglers. Most of the Confederate troops were already pulling back, stunned by the sudden and almost simultaneous appearance of hostile regiments on both of their supposedly invulnerable flanks. When Rush Hawkins later claimed the hero's laurels of the Roanoke Island battle, the Massachusetts veterans took umbrage. Well into the 20th century, bitter arguments raged between the regiments in the pages of memoirs, regimental histories, and veterans' magazines. End quote. Well, while quarreling over which federal regiment was the first to plant its flag on the enemy redoubt would rage for years, the actual fighting on Roanoke Island was over soon after the rebel position on the road was outflanked. Thirty minutes after the roadway redoubt was captured by the Yankees, the unfortunate Colonel Shaw raised the white flag. He later explained that, quote, With the very great disparity of forces, the moment the redoubt was flanked, I considered the island lost. The struggle could have been protracted, and the small body of brave men which had been held in reserve might have been brought up to receive the fire of the overwhelming force on our flank, but they would have been sacrificed without the smallest hope of a successful outcome. And so, in just two days, Ambrose Burnside had managed to crack open the key to the Confederate defenses on the North Carolina coast, and had done it at a cost of only three sailors killed and 11 wounded, and 37 soldiers killed, and 214 wounded. And in the battle for Roanoke Island, the Confederates suffered 23 killed and 58 wounded, and while a handful of rebels managed to escape to the mainland, a staggering 2,675 were taken prisoner. Without the means to care for such a large number of prisoners, Burnside decided to parole his Confederate captives on their honor until a possible future exchange could be worked out. On February 21st, five of the federal steamships carried the rebel parolees to nearby Elizabeth City, where they disembarked. Following the capture of Roanoke Island, Burnside, in keeping with McClellan's original design, Burnside started to plan much larger-scaled operations against other important sites on the North Carolina coast. His next objective would be New Bern, the Tar Heel State's second-largest city and a vital port and commercial center located at the confluence of the Neuse and Trent Rivers. On March 11th, Burnside and 11,000 troops boarded various vessels and departed Roanoke Island, bound for New Bern. And since that seems like a good stopping point, 
You guys will have to wait until next week to see what happens next with the Burnside Expedition. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Ironclads and Columbiads, The Civil War in North Carolina, The Coast, by William R. Trotter. Trotter has actually written several books looking at the Civil War in North Carolina, and he decided to look at the war in the Tar Heel State by geographic region. So the other two volumes are about the Piedmont and the mountains, while this particular book focuses on events on the coast of North Carolina. And each of his books really aren't dry academic tomes. They show that Trotter is a great storyteller because he manages to communicate a lot of detail while still spinning a good yarn. Anyway, you can find Ironclads and Columbiads, along with all of our other book recommendations, if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then we have a programming note we want to share with y'all. We wanted to let y'all know that we'll use next week's episode to continue with the story of the Burnside Expedition, but then we'll be taking the next week off, so there won't be a new episode the middle weekend of March. And when we come back, we'll be starting the Battle of Shiloh, but we won't just be kicking off a new topic. We'll also be starting a new schedule of when we release episodes, because after mid-March, we'll be releasing a new episode every other week. And after almost two and a half years of doing our best to give you guys a new episode every weekend, we decided we're going to change things up a bit and switch to a schedule where we'll release a new show every other week. We'll still release two members' episodes each month, and we'll still aim to have those out around the 10th and 20th of every month. So that won't change. But like Rich said, as far as a new regular episode of the podcast, we'll be releasing those shows every other week after mid-March. And speaking of members' episodes, we do have several new members of the Strawfoot Brigade to thank this week. Duncan, Michael, and Casey. So thanks. It's good to have you on board. And then we also want to thank Alex S. from Washington, D.C. and Ben M. from Canada for their their donations this past week. Thanks, y'all. And then, as always, we're eternally grateful to Spiritwood Music for their permission to use the song Midnight on the Water as the music you guys hear at the beginning and end of each and every episode of the podcast. Besides Midnight on the Water, Spiritwood Music has lots of other great songs you can find on iTunes and Amazon, so check them out. And then thanks to all of y'all for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I hope you'll join us again next week when we continue with the story of the Burnside Expedition. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.